Some of the hardest problems in the world exist far above the planet. Our job, to launch the smartest solutions, to protect our satellites, clean up our clutter, to propel breakthroughs in propulsion, to learn more about our place in the universe, to outpace emerging threats. Every day, the Aerospace Corporation uses the latest technologies to ensure our nation's safety and leadership in space. Hi, and welcome to the Space Policy Show. I'm your host, Rebecca Rose. As always, you can find us on Twitter using hashtag the Space Policy Show, and you can engage with our experts on Vimeo using the chat box. We would love it if you would sign up for our latest news and alerts at aerospace.org slash policy. Today's episode is on protecting Earth's airspace from space debris. We all know space debris leads to more danger of collisions in space, but have you thought about what happens when debris falls through the atmosphere? Today, Aerospace's Bill Ayler will talk with Michael Kazarian and Sven Kaltenhauser about protecting Earth's airspace. Dr. Bill Ayler is a technical fellow with the Center for Orbital and Reentry Debris Studies, also known as CORDS, at the Aerospace Corporation. He's responsible for conducting analyses on spacecraft reentry and reentry breakup, and has published numerous works on the topic and steps to mitigation. Sven Kaltenhauser is head of the Air Traffic Management Simulation Department at the German Aerospace Center DLR. Institute of Flight Guidance, and of the DLR Air Traffic Validation Center. He is involved with research on higher airspace operation and the integration of space vehicle operation into air traffic management. Dr. Michael Kazarian is an adjunct professor of astronautical engineering at the University of Southern California, where he teaches graduate courses in space safety design and operations for the Distance Education Network. He is also president of the International Space Safety Foundation. Welcome everyone and over to Bill to get us started. Thank you, Rebecca. So I'm uh, Bill Ayler at Aerospace, and uh, we're going to have a nice, uh, we'll call it a fireside chat about space debris and reentry things and uh, protecting aircraft from space debris and what the, some of the issues there are. And so we're really looking forward to that. And um, so I, I'm in aerospace. I've been there for a long time, done a lot of work in reentry breakups and reentries and things like that, space debris. And uh, so and I've done some work on uh, protecting aircraft from debris as well. We'll talk more about that later on. I thought what I'd like to do is go ahead and just have maybe each of our panelists uh, or fireside chat members uh, say a little bit about uh, their background and, and how they got into this business. So Sven, would you like to start that? Oh yeah, thank you, Bill. Um, yeah, so I'm actually, uh, I'm working for the uh, German Aerospace Center and with uh, the Department of uh, ATM Simulation, which is actually uh, um, having the job to validate new air traffic management concepts. So uh, quite a while ago, I think it was around 2014 or 2015, we started to look into some new concepts um, dealing with the uh, question, how would we integrate actually um, spacecrafts uh, which might approach an airport uh, with the Germany. And that triggered some, some questions for us. Um, we wanted to dive into that and look into the procedures on how actually to integrate space vehicle operations into uh, the air traffic. And uh, we started to build a, a small team taking care about these questions and um, doing research on, on those topics. And this is what we're doing in our department with, with this small, small team. Oh, very nice. And Michael? What's your uh, background here and, and interest? Hi, Bill. Thank you for having me here today. Uh, I've worked uh, uh, in the aerospace industry at TRW and uh, Boeing on government and commercial satellite programs and then working in human space flight, uh, focusing in flight safety. And now I teach safety at the University of Southern California, both design and operations. I have a particular mm -hmm. interest in space debris and the interaction with the airspace and mitigating the hazards from re-entering spacecraft. Oh, very nice. And I think uh, maybe to get this started, I'd like to show a little chart to kind of get everybody on line as to what we're actually talking about here. And uh, so James, if you could bring that up, that would be nice. All right, well, thank you. Uh, so basically what I wanna do is talk a little bit about the re-entry breakup process and, and really what, what are the issues here? But first, let me just mention that uh, what Sven has talked about was uh, um, bringing a re-entering vehicle like a space shuttle or something like that into a uh, into airspace and into a, into a 
say, heavy lands uh, at a commercial site, perhaps. Uh, so that's one part of the problem. Those are vehicles that are designed to survive, survive reentry, and they will, um, uh, they, they'll basically designed to go through the reentry process and not break apart. Uh, so stay as one big piece and come in and land, and bring their cargo down. And um, so uh, that's that's one form of reentry. The other form of reentry is if you have something that's not designed to survive reentry, that that it will be exposed to the reentry environment, which is uh, quite severe. It's got uh, a lot of heating and loads associated with it. And uh, as you can see in this little uh, illustration, uh, you see on the left uh, that re uh, vehicle reentering there. Uh, basically, that is uh, the, what it looks uh, the, say a general generic spacecraft would look like, and uh, as if and it's coming in around uh, four miles a second, roughly. So it's moving quite quite quickly, and uh, when it starts to begin to hit the atmosphere, you'll start to see a little bit of heating and some small loads and so forth. And so this, some of that leading them, uh, heating them will break off some of the solar panels. It'll start heating the outside. If it's an aluminum can, some of the aluminum will get hot. That'll melt away and you'll get major breakup. And you can see that as this process continues, you start to see uh, that fragments from that major breakup uh, going ahead and following their own trajectories. And then also this subsequent breakup means that each, some of those fragments themselves can break apart. And then you'll see that little ground footprint. So the idea is that this debris from this uh, reentering vehicle will be spread over, can be spread over a long footprint, say a couple of thousand uh, kilometers long, maybe 70 kilometers wide, and it's along the ground footprint of this particular vehicle. So along that ground track is where it will come down. Um, the last 18 or so kilometers of that uh, fall generally will be coming, all these objects that survive will be coming straight down. They'll be falling through that area. And uh, the 18 kilometers or so are roughly where you worry about commercial aircraft flying. And so that's kind of what we're talking about here is uh, the issue is, when you have a, an object coming in and it survives and then this debris falls down, what is the threat to aircraft? How much you do something about that? And, um, and, th and you know, wh what do we know about that? So that's just an overview and I, you can put the chart away, thanks. So Sven, did I do a good job of outlining um, the kind of work that you're interested in? Yeah, absolutely. I think what you what you have shown is, is um, let's say, the essential uh, problem we are talking about here. Uh, yeah. So uh, we are confronted with uh, quite a quite a large uh, pattern of um, a ground footprint of possible debris falling from satellite. If we let's say put it as a as a general issue, and if you compare it to uh, like you said a controlled reentry or uh, launch operations. We are, of course, also dealing with uh, topics like um, using hazard areas to protect the airspace um, in case that we have an off nominal situation. So, but uh, the advantage we have, if you call it advantage, is that for these kind of uh, operations, we have, let's say, a controlled vehicle uh, following a, a predetermined trajectory. Mm. We know this trajectory from the calculations pretty well. We have done uh, some calculations uh, before we even have this flight taking uh, place to calculate the pop, uh, the, the hazard areas which might result uh, from a breakup event or from, from an off normal situation along this trajectory. Um, mm. So there's a good determination of that. And if you know uh, at which certain time uh, and, and at which, uh, which identical time this uh, this breakup will happen if you have the last state vector, you can calculate mm -hmm. this kind of hazard area from there. And it's a smaller hazard area usually than the one you have you have shown here, depending of mm -hmm. course on the type of of, uh, of operation for during during launch phase or if we have a re-entering mm -hmm. phase. Mm -hmm. um, for a satellite, as you said, those uh, those hazard areas are. Uh, quite large due to uh, the effect. And we have a higher level of uncertainty in here. So where actually the breakup occurs, and that makes this all very, very more difficult than we have um, uh, the um, procedures uh, we have now in place for, let's say, controlled re-entries or, or launch events. Mm -hmm, that's right. Yeah, I think that's a good point. I, I, as I mentioned, uh, these things will be traveling at four miles or four miles or say seven kilometers per second coming in, and every second is going. That means they're going a good distance in that in that amount of time, and so there really is an issue there uh, as to where things come down. Uh, so, Michael, what uh, 
if you were trying to warn an aircraft away, or what, what kind of information would you need to do that? Well, before we go there, um, another hazard mm -hmm. is from uh, launch vehicles as well. Isn't that True. correct? I mean, just yes. this month, we've had two pieces from uh, um, that were detected, one that came into uh, the Washington State and one that washed up on the shore of Oregon. And yes. these were very large pieces of debris that survived uh, the launch due to the particular orbit uh, that they, uh, uh, the trajectory that they followed. And then mm -hmm. surprisingly, there was the launch last year of the Long March 5B uh, about a year ago that uh, landed at uh, the upper stage about 100 miles east of New York City. And this was the largest uncontrolled reentry object in decades. Is that and so with more international players, more commercial players, um, these events are now more frequent and um, uh, of concern. Uh, yeah, that's a really good point. And I think you're, you're absolutely right that uh, this launch stage that came in and, and dumped some debris in, uh, in northern Washington there, Washington State, um, is an example that uh, some of these materials can survive reentry just fine. And there's some good examples of that on, on the web if people look for that or they can see it in the news occasionally. But your point's a really good one. We're looking at more and more of those kinds of things as time goes forward. And that's one reason why I think this issue is becoming more prominent. And uh, so, Sven, how, do you have ideas of how um, well, I just want your to system might? You know, we've, we, we've made ahead. a good effort to make sure that those pressure vessels survive during their operational life. And now yeah. they're so strong and robust that they survive their reentry, which is maybe something we don't want to happen. It would be great if they That's would turn right. up and not create a hazard. So uh, I happen to work on the standards committees and work on a number of programs at, in commercial programs and NASA programs in pressure vessels. And so maybe we've done too good a job, but that is one of the areas yes. of the research is to de design for demisability on reentry. And this will be a key uh, design criteria as we move forward in yep. when we look at these satellite programs. Yeah, that's right. I think design de design for demise actually is a is a good thing to be thinking about as we go forward. You're exactly right. So, um, but yes, yeah, Sven, I was just asking you, have you done any work with design for demise at all? Or uh, what are your thoughts on that? Oh, yeah. So, um, well, um, just like you said, uh, I mean, the, uh, the risk is coming, uh, when we're talking about risk for um, commercial aircraft or, or um, airspace users uh, in general, of course, we have to see the risk uh, based on the effects which take uh, place during these kind of um, operations, like in re-entry of an uh, uncontrolled mm -hmm. vehicle in that case. So um, we have, of course, two options to minimize the risk. One is, of course, to uh, reduce the number of potential debris falling down, um, yeah. uh, to simply avoid uh, any kind of that. And that would be the, uh, the topic we just uh, talked about on um, approaching, let's say, uh, uh, this in a, in, in a way how we are designing spacecraft. Um, yeah. This is um, a topic we personally, and let's say, uh, our, our group is not is not working on us. We are, let's say, tackling the problem more from an from an airspace uh, and air mm -hmm. traffic uh, management perspective. Nevertheless, we let's say we we have to deal with what um, kind of risk is being calculated based on well the models um, uh, about um, the breakup event, about the process, how those um, spacecrafts are. Uh, disintegrating and and how much um, and how many um, debris parts are actually being produced uh, right. and then we have to uh, dive into this risk and find ways on how to protect um, aircraft on um, let's say getting in touch getting a collision with these kind of uh, debris um, and for of course the probability of these kinds of events are um, uh, the playing a big role in, in, in talking about the subject because um, usually, um, I mean, we are talking uh, with, uh, with um, uh, spacecraft, we are talking about a global um, mm -hmm. problem, so to say, when we are talking about that. So yeah. uh, you're not, um, and, 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 and re-entry, especially if you have an uncontrolled vehicle, uh, can occur somewhere uh, around the globe. 
which on the other hand is uh, distributing the risk um, also in a, in a kind of a global way, depending of course on the trajectory of the, uh, of the spacecraft. So we have to address also the collision risk as part of the problem and not trying to define uh, protecting air, uh, aircraft just simply by um, taking measures to avoid every single part of debris uh, where we don't, especially as long as we are not knowing where they are falling down. Yes, Finn, that's a really good point. And actually, for disposal of spacecraft, you actually can do it a couple of ways. One way would be to uh, control where that entry point is going to be so that the debris will come down in an area where there is no one. An example of that would be the, uh, the supply vehicles that go to the International Space Station. Uh, those are typically brought down into the South Pacific where uh, there, there's nobody there. They will provide a notice to airmen for to stay out of the area when something's coming in. And so that's one way of disposing of spacecraft. And as a matter of fact, for end of life disposal of hardware, that is, that is the preferred approach for exactly that reason. In some cases, however, you don't have control, and it's and it's um, it's it's the if you will the cheapest way to bring something down is to just let the atmosphere drag it down slowly, and when that happens, you'll have uh, the object basically come down anywhere on the planet. It'll be basically on somewhere under the orbit track. You don't know what time that'll be or exactly where that debris will come down. So that is a real issue, and um, we do see. Uh, things like that relatively frequently. I might mention that I was looking last year, we had about 55 objects come down that were uh, larger than about 150 kilograms. And uh, about a dozen of those were uh, the uh, iridium satellites that were being disposed. Fascinating, interesting thing too is it's very rare to actually find debris from any of these reentries. That makes it hard too from a num for a number of reasons. For commercial satellite operators, it's a difficult design trade because they want to extend the life as long as they can to get as much as much commercial service. And sometimes they have an on-orbit failure, maybe five years beyond their design life. But up until that time, they're providing a valuable service. And yet it's a difficult decision to deorbit a functioning satellite just to protect for the end of life disposal. Yes, that's exactly right. And uh, and that does create, there's, there's a be a big push as we start seeing these larger con, large constellations going into space. There's a big push to make these satellites very reliable so that they have very reliable disposal systems and that you can have, you know, your, your, the abil your ability to dispose of a spacecraft is, is, a, is, is very reliable. And so that will helpfully, dis, uh, helpfully make that a better issue. Um, but but if you look at this from a, a sort of more of a global perspective, shall I say, um, when you're bringing spacecraft down from a constellation or bringing it down in a controlled way, you basically are coming through objects that are flying below it, uh, like spacecraft in addition to aircraft which comes into the atmosphere. But in but in orbit too, there are spacecraft that fly at different levels in the uh, in this in the uh, environment, and um, in those spacecraft will be. Uh, in a sense, exposed to the risk that these guys pose as they come down. So there's a lot of challenges associated with uh, re-entering vehicles. Bill, you mentioned that there were some 50 satellites, 50 objects larger than 150 kilograms and 12 very large ones a year. I mean, that's one a month of uh, the very large ones and about 40% of that will, of the, the mass will survive re-entry with items like pressure vessels, thrusters, batteries, which do not do very well on demising during breakup. Uh, as we move to the large constellations or mega constellations, as some have called them by a number of companies, uh, in the next five to 10 years, we're gonna see a much larger number of satellites entering. And even if they are designed for, to, uh, you know, for controlled re-entry, there's gonna be errors and anomalies that happen that will lead to, um, as we call them, unplanned events and anomalies that are things that we should be concerned about. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's a very good point. And also, um, a number of these large constellations are talking about bringing, bringing their spacecraft down to the point where they get captured by the atmosphere, which in a sense is a, 
in, in our context, a called a random reentry, meaning that it's the entry point, the, land, the specific point where it comes into the atmosphere is not controlled. And so uh, it will basically get down low and the atmosphere will grab it and it'll come in when it's when it's ready. So, yes, it's uh, it's uh, it's going to be an interesting problem to see how this actually evolves over time when you start seeing these larger constellations go up. And you're right about the number per per year. For example, uh, the 50 to 75 per year is probably a, a you know reasonable number right now for what's coming down. But we're talking about going up by, say, a factor of 10 on that. And uh, or maybe higher. And if we start seeing large numbers of spacecraft come in, that's when we get into the issue of, you know, what are we going to do to protect aircraft? And what does that mean for hazards on the ground? And those kinds of things. Yeah, absolutely, Bill. Um, uh, and I'm um, uh, like to just mention uh, the question, of course, is uh, for the mega constellation, if they have very reliable deorbiting uh, systems, uh, that's, of course, a very um, important uh, feature, uh, and, and this reliability is an important feature to make those uh, constellations be sustainable uh, and sustain their orbits uh, clear for operation. Um, but like you said, the, the question still will be, uh, are they able to, uh, let's say, target their re-entry at a, a certain uh, point on Earth, or uh, will they be slowed down by the atmosphere? And if, if we have this kind of slow down, slowing down procedure and the, un the rather unpredictable um, Point of reentry uh, where that's going to be take place. This is actually where, well, when we talk about how to 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 protect um, the air traffic uh, against possible falling debris, this is where the trouble starts, so to say. Um, so hmm. we've we've both been in, in touch with with our colleagues from the European Space Agency uh, to um, they they have a a large group uh, talking about um, space debris uh, modeling. Uh, protection in the, in the European Space Operations Center. Uh, and so we were discussing actually, so if, uh, how can we make use of um, those tools we are going to uh, develop and uh, make research on, on, on how to get real-time information out to, for example, for air traffic control to uh, act on these kind of events. And uh, the, the issue was, and they, they have, I mean, like, like you have in the United States, of course, as well, um, really, Good prediction algorithms. They have good models, uh, atmospheric models, uh, to try to determine the point of entry based on the slowdown procedure from from uh, the beginning atmosphere. Nevertheless, uh, there the uncertainty still is quite high, so that the resulting area of uh, the potential entry, I mean, it's getting narrower over time. Um, uh, but of course, it depends very much on what kind of actual information can we get, the last information we get about the state vector of the of the spacecraft, how good are those data, and the better we can determine the correct position of the spacecraft in its final minutes, uh, so to say, the better we can act upon that can determine a certain, certain area where it's going to come down, determine the, um, let's say, the hazard area, the footprint of the debris, and try to make actions on these kind of knowledge. And this is what, what drives us to, let's say, find a way and how to come to a better accuracy in, in determining where those uh, space cars are com coming down, and then find ways to um, protect the airspace, uh, protect the aircraft in the airspace at, that, at those areas. So um, there are a couple of questions uh, which, which are uh, related to that, but Bill, I would like to play the ball back into you, Aria. Um, uh, I know you have made some some research uh, on on the part uh, determining the risk uh, uh, which might be posed by um, the mega constellations, of course, with modeling their development over the next uh, let's say decade, uh, so to say. But maybe you can tell us a little bit more about um, well your ideas about the risk we have to deal with and um, if we can compare it with with current numbers out there. Uh, yes, man, that's a really good question as to uh, the large constellations and uh, what the effects of those might be. And um, basically, a couple of things are, are interesting here. We In the past, we don't recover debris very much, um, and it's really necessary to see what's going to survive to hit the ground. And so we try to collect anything we can uh, to analyze that, see what kind of heating is had and so forth, but we don't find much. And uh, so that's on the large stuff. That's one thing. 
On the small stuff, uh, unfortunately, small stuff can be a hazard to aircraft flying at high speeds, uh, commercial aircraft in particular. And um, so the issue with small stuff is we really don't have much evidence of what survives. Uh, so one of the things I've looked at has been some limited testing that was done years ago uh, using a radar uh, to basically look at uh, the, the stuff that survived reentry. And of course, the Columbia accident was another one where there was radar data collected and there's quite a long uh, quite a lot of debris was recovered because of the extensive searches that were uh, done there. Around 80,000 fragments, I think, was the number. So uh, again, a lot can survive, but uh, we don't know a lot about that right now. We'd like to know more as we move forward. So, Michael, did, what would you? What was your? What are your thoughts about how you might warn aircraft away or something like this? So, there's really three parts to being able to develop a system to protect the aircraft. First is you have to be able to track space debris. The uh, United States government does a very good job of that, but there are now a large number of commercial players that are using ground-based radar and optical measurements to improve the precision to be better able to predict the re-entry of these large objects. The second part is to understand the breakup and the footprint that they cause uh, in the airspace. Uh, the aerospace and others have done some excellent work on controlled re-entries and measuring the breakup, but there are now new targets of opportunity with existing cell phone cameras taking pictures of objects that have been coming, re-entering, as well as uh, radar measurements of, of targets of opportunity, I call them, of re-entering objects that we can go in and analyze the data that we already collect. And the third part, which has always been recognized as the most difficult, is, is conveying that information in an actionable manner to the users of the airspace, uh, airplane pilots, commercial pilots, general aviation pilots, all those that might be uh, at risk due to the re-entering spacecraft. Um, unfortunately, uh, working within the existing structures of air traffic control in the United States and around the world is very difficult to get notice in a very short period to the pilots in order to uh, change their flight plans. One of the proposals that I have come forward with is there are now mobile-based applications and uh, two pilots that are using, that are connected to the internet and are um, uh, using systems to update their flight plans in response to weather anomalies and other events, perhaps, you know, uh, government closing the airspace for natural disasters or national emergencies. And with such connectivity, we are able to, with a proper system, able to convey that information directly to pilots in command. I believe the European Space Agency has looked at adding transponders on re-entering debris that would notify pilots directly. That is another opportunity to do that. But of course, you have to rely on spacecraft operators uh, allocating weight and then making sure that those systems survive the re-entry and properly provide the notice. So there's lots of ways that we can do this. Um, the idea is, is, you know, with safety, we talk about layers of the onion. In other words, we want multiple layers of protection to provide the um, control and mitigate the hazards uh, that exist. Um, as we get grow with more users in the space, more users in the airspace as well, these numbers are going to become pretty size con um, considerable that we can't just uh, dismiss them as being, you know, so small and minuscule and remote. We need to start thinking about them. And now's the time to start planning and implementing them. So in five years, as these large constellations become uh, realized, as we have large commercial space transportation vehicles going up and coming down, that we are in a position to um, provide access to the airspace in a safe uh, manner. Yes, as a matter of fact, you mentioned early, uh, earlier about design for demise. You know, one thing that could be done is to design spacecraft so that anything that survives is small and lightweight. Uh, that would be one way of dealing with it too. Uh, the threshold for uh, a few, a few grams of solid material, for example, could really damage an aircraft and flying at you know, high altitudes and such. And so those are uh, issues that uh, could be helped by doing something about design for demise as an opportunity too. 
And, and Sven, do you have any thoughts on on uh, on this topic? Um, yes, uh, Michael, I think you you raised a very good good point on um, uh, finding ways to make actionable uh, to, to exploit the information which are there and make them actionable for the protection of the airspace and for the protection of um, other airspace users. Um, so uh, what you have mentioned it um, reminds me of of some work we have done. Um, coming from the idea on how to inform um, uh, aircraft uh, during, let's say, breakup events during launch uh, and re-entry operations in, in, in our in control base. Uh, and we did some um, research on how we can uh, maybe use um, a system called the system-wide information management, or in short term, uh, the abbreviation is SWIM. Um, which is kind of an, uh, a solution like the intranet for air traffic management. So it's a service uh, service oriented architecture, which uh, is built in a way that it can provide services to uh, people who are connecting themselves to the swim. And the idea is to make at a certain point in time in the development, every uh, participant of the uh, air traffic making kind of a user of, of, of uh, the system-wide information management and also act as a kind of a subsystem for, for this. So with this uh, development taking place, and I mean, it's a process system-wide information management just introduced um, uh, during the next-gen process in the US, but also during uh, the CESAR program, which is the Single European Sky um, uh, ATM research, uh, to implement that in the control of um, and managing of airspaces all around. So an interesting part of that is that um, system, uh, the, the SWIM concept is also uh, built in a way that it shall enable uh, communication between aircraft and ground. And we um, uh, designed some, um, some experiments to figure out if we can provide these kind of informations like a hazard area um, through those uh, system-wide information management messages and through this kind of service and, and, and build an, an example service to uh, transmit these informations uh, up to an electronic flight back of an, of an aircraft. So in a simulation, we have done that uh, in a different purpose. Um, but I think this is, it really shows that these kind of mechanisms are possible. If SWIM is a way to go there, this is something uh, one can discuss. Um, there are, of course, also other possible ways of applications. But it shows that you can actually connect systems during flight uh, with uh, other information sources. Uh, and if you build in a way that you can also maintain security of uh, data communications, like a secure swim, um, then this might really get a solution which can be exploited. And um, um, well, there might be different ways to on, on how to do that. Um, but I think we are approaching um, a technology standpoint where we actually can make these kind of information actionable not only through ATC, who might be in the best position to receive this kind of information, but even on a way that you can inform um, not only commercial flights, but maybe also general aviation flights, which might buy into such a service. Uh, that's, very, that's very good. And actually, you know, what uh, both of you are talking about is having a system that would uh, take information uh, that is collected in some fashion, uh, and get it available to pilots quickly. And I think for a re-entry, re it would have to be fairly quickly because uh, once, you've, once you've seen an object, you have maybe 10 minutes or some, something on that order of time to get a message out to a pilot, get it out, get data back, process it, get it out. Unless you did what, do what Michael talks about, uh, suggested, which is to put a transponder or something that would actually come down with the debris and would provide, uh, you know, if they provide aircraft in the area of, 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 of a notice from that. Is that kind of what you had, what you've talked about, Michael? Right. So that is one idea that has been proposed. And I kind of like the idea of using the internet connectivity through applications that plan mission planning for uh, flight planning that is used both by general aviation, commercial pilots, and now even being adopted by military. Uh, you know, we're, we've gotten, um, as you pointed out, this is uh, a very short window of time, you know, not uh, still minutes, not quite like a warning on an earthquake, but clearly uh, issuing a notice to airmen and expecting them to take action would be 
uh, too difficult. You can't say next Thursday we're going to have uh, a pro uh, uh, you know a five minute closure of a 200 mile swath of the airspace. That's not something that we are able to predict this far in advance and plan around. On the other hand, you know things like uh, turbulence, uh, inversions, cold fronts that come through that lead to problems for aircraft. We've been very good at monitoring them, tracking them, predicting them, and conveying that information in a timely method. Back when we were flying before COVID, you would know sometimes you would speed up or sometimes you'd be go slightly north or south to avoid a, um, uh, a difficult area, a difficult spot. And I see an external user collecting that information and conveying that in a similar way to weather anomalies in order to protect, uh, to go uh, better routes and to uh, per, uh, uh, avoid these hazardous spaces. And if we can get it to a very narrow and small footprint over a very short period of time, this is something that can be become actionable. You can usually, um, you know, slow down to if it's only a few minutes. Uh, and you know, you know, several miles and um, you know, hundred miles in advance, you can slow down or speed up or go, you know, north, south, or you know, avoid that spot in a much better way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. I think that's exactly right. Um, yeah, I might want to mention a couple of things. One is um, some people wonder, you know, has anybody ever been hit by a piece of debris on, say, on the ground? And it's, and it's an indication of what the risk is right now, that, that we've only had one person who's actually been brushed on the shoulder by a very lightweight piece of debris. Uh, she was not injured at all. And, uh, and you can find pictures of her on the web. Uh, Lottie Williams is her name. And um, so she has that distinction. And um, so it's, it, it's rare to find anyone like that. It's, that's the only person we know of in, since we've been putting things into space that have been injured. And we do find debris on the ground, but not a lot. And I mentioned that these uh, Iridium satellites, these uh, 12 Iridium satellites that come down uh, last year, in 2019 actually, um, as far as I know, there's only been, uh, for all Iridium reentries, there's only been one piece of debris found on the ground. So a lot of this stuff lands in the water, which we don't, we, you know, we just don't see. And a lot of it lands in places where people don't see it. So uh, it's, there's more down than, than what we've seen for sure, but we just don't find it very often. So again, what we're talking about right now is a situation where the risk is low, but the risk will be increased when you increase the number of reentering objects by say a thousand. And, and that's what make it, makes it more of an issue at this present time, is that if you talk about large information, these large constellations coming down, and they have a lot of mass with them, uh, then some of these things that you've talked about that are composite pressure vessels, for example, those things are used on spacecraft and they will survive. And they may not be a hazard to somebody on the ground if they're light enough, but they certainly would be a hazard to an aircraft. And being trying to, try, trying to be aware of where those are would be good. And if we could figure out a way of, of, of actually providing a warning when something actually hits the atmosphere and really get, begins to heat up and break apart, that would be superb. As you so pointed I, out, some of the re-entering spacecraft that are creating a hazard have gone maybe 5, 10, 15 years beyond the end of the life and were put up maybe 30 or 40 years ago. So as we yes. start to put up, you know, exponentially more spacecraft, and also as we have commercial participants uh, putting up human spacecraft, um, these have kind of different profiles, re-entering profiles. They become um, a different hazard to think about. And then as we have more participants launching spacecraft from commercial spaceports around the world, I think there's some 25 or so that have been uh, identified or started to building. We're going to be having these kinds of, of, um, uh, of pieces from uh leftover upper stages that that don't quite uh, get disposed in the proper manner as designed. And so this is not a problem for tomorrow or next year, but in the coming years, this is something that we need to really address. And introducing demisability requirements on spacecraft would certainly help. But as we point, I pointed out, I think of the layers of the onion as where we want multiple layers of protection, multiple ways that we want to reduce the risk by um, having more demisability, having more control entries in the South Pacific and other areas that are not trafficked by ships. But we do need to have, I believe, some protection um, in the heavily trafficked areas um, for this uh, hazard. Mm -hmm. 
And Sven, for the uh, the, the swim uh, process, do you uh, foresee having uh, even the control spacecraft that are coming in, say, to an airport uh, to be carrying some kind of uh, black boxes or something that would inform regular uh, inform safety people? So yeah, but that's uh, that's an interesting point because that's that was actually also something we had in mind maybe to expand on that uh, to make also not only like we said uh, every aircraft and uh, to be considered as a um, um, as a subsystem for the system wide information management but also including um, spacecraft which are at a certain time can be considered as an airspace user um, if. You have, of course, launch operations where that applies. You have uh, plant re-entering of aircraft, uh, of spacecraft, uh, where this would, would apply. And if you consider also these kind of suborbital flights, if it's an A2A -A flight, which we are talking about now for space drones, but also for research, uh, but also for, let's say, future concepts like uh, A2B suborbital flights, really connecting via uh, hypersonic flights, for example, in the far future, one might discuss how far that future is uh, away. Um, if we are connecting several places on Earth uh, through these kind of uh, um, connections, that might also be, uh, they might be to, to be considered as an airspace user in a certain way. Um, and um, they are actually working on, on trying to include them into, uh, let's say, operational concepts uh, which will deal with with the way these kind of uh, vehicles will be included in a let's say in a common view of um, air traffic being managed and operated uh, on a global level. Let me um, point out one one issue which crossed my mind while we are talking about the warning um, uh, participating aircraft through such a connected system. One thing which we have on our uh, on our plans to to look a little bit deeper into is, of course, um, uh, a trade off which you have to consider if you talk about warning an aircraft to let's say avoid a certain area uh, due to a potential risk of uh, falling space debris. Uh, and this this trade off is related, of course, to um, the way you are going to uh, have to interact with the aircraft and to. Uh, change aircraft um, uh, to let aircraft change their uh, flight trajectory, deviating from their planned route, uh, initiating an avoidance procedure, uh, and depending on what amount of other aircraft are in that area. So you have to consider these kind of, of activities also to pose a certain risk um, because you're, let's say, getting away from, let's say, the pre-planned, well-organized um, flow of traffic. Um, and you have to really make sure that, um, let's say, you are quite certain that these kind of operations and maneuvers make sense to avoid a certain risk uh, while not imposing a bigger risk by, uh, let's say, um, actioning, um, uh, let's say, a very dense airspace uh, with a lot of populated uh, aircraft and over an area of, like we said, about uh, several hundred kilometers uh, of size. So um, this is getting uh, me back to the question the, 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 the better we understand and the better we can close down uh, the, um, let's say, the calculated areas where we expect debris to happen, uh, the better we can calculate this, uh, the risk of uh, those um, objects, um, what kind of risk they pose to actually collide with an aircraft, the better we can evaluate the trade off against. Uh, actioning uh, aircraft to move out of the way. And this is something which, of course, let's say from our perspective, looking into the safety of um, air traffic control, of air traffic navigation, want to figure out to make sure that we are um, not doing the wrong thing by avoiding one risk, but posing another risk uh, to the uh, operation. Uh, Sven, I thought you made a really good point about if you know where something might come down, you could sort of prepare for that. And actually, uh, you can, uh, you, you know the orbits of these objects as they're coming down pretty well. You just don't know where along that orbit it's going to come down. But the same thing, by the same token, you don't, if there's something that's not coming over an area that you're concerned about, you know it's not coming down. And so you can use that type of information uh, to sort of pre-predict where you might have a problem. And uh, that might be useful to you in the long term. 
So I think with that, uh, we should uh, maybe uh, call it a day. And I just want to thank all of you for participating. I think we've had a really interesting discussion. Uh, Michael, I thought your perspectives were very good. And Sven, it's really interesting to learn about the SWIM process. And I hope we've given uh, people who are watching this a nice overview of reentry hazards and uh, how large constellations might affect things. Thank you very much. Thank you for having us. Thank you very much, Bill. Thanks for having us. Great talking to you. Mm -hmm. A big thanks to Bill, Michael, and Sven for that great discussion. And thank you to our production team, Colleen Stover, James Liggins, and Jordan Bingham. As always, check us out on Twitter at hashtag the Space Policy Show and sign up for our latest news and alerts at aerospace.org slash policy. Be sure to check out this episode wherever you get your podcast, and we look forward to having you tune into our next episode. And until then, take care. Thank you.